Well, good morning and happy Easter to you. Uh, if you're watching this on Easter morning, obviously happy Easter. If you're not watching this on Easter morning, still happy Easter. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk today about the, uh, the meaning of the re resurrection uh, in this reflection. And to do that, I'm going to draw on all of the Gospel accounts and St. Paul's uh, witness as well. Uh, not just the reading that I, I, I chose from the lectionary for today, the, even though that's one of my favourite readings uh, of, the, uh, of the resurrection, the meeting of Mary Magdalene with uh, Jesus. Um, so I'm going to t draw on all the Gospel accounts. Now for some people uh, this can raise problems because of course... Uh, all of the gospel accounts differ. They, they, none of them say the same thing about what happened on uh, Easter Sunday. But that has never really proved a problem for the church as a whole. Because rather than get tied down with differences of historicity, what happened... I mean, were there one, was there one woman or three women go to the tomb, or was there one angel or two angels, or were there sightings in Jerusalem only, or in Galilee only, or in both? All these sorts of things, we can argue until the cows come home and not get anywhere. We get, stu get, um, we get stuck when we talk about the uh, history of what the Gospel accounts say. What we need to concentrate on is the meaning of the Gospel accounts, and Paul, of course. And to try and um, uh, get us to understand what I mean about the meaning of the accounts, I want us to think about the parables, just for a minute, the parables of Jesus. I've never talked with uh, anyone who was remotely bothered about the, whether there really was a man who had two sons and one of them up sticks and went away and ended up um, feeding pigs. Uh, and I've never met anyone who was remotely bothered whether there really was a man who got mugged on the way down to Jericho and uh, whether there really was a, a priest or a Samaritan that went by. The historicity of those parables, whether they actually happened or not, is not the important thing. The important thing is what they mean. Parables are truth-filled. They convey truth without necessarily being based in historical fact. And by saying this, I am not suggesting for a second that the resurrection was not a historical fact only that the historical accuracy of what actually happened is of very minor importance. It's what all of the accounts mean that is much more important for this first, uh, on that first Easter Sunday and for every, every, uh, every Easter Sunday ever since. Now there are three truths, three meanings that we can draw from all of the accounts uh, in the Bible that everyone can attest to. The first one is very simple. Jesus lives. Jesus lives. Whatever else is different in any of the accounts, Jesus is alive. The second thing, that, that if you believe that Jesus lives, the second thing that that moves on to is that Jesus is Lord. If Jesus lives, then the Gospel accounts said, well then, Jesus is Lord. And then, if you decide Jesus lives and Jesus is Lord, that moves on to the, uh, the, fir the third uh, idea that came through from the Bible, that Jesus was the first, the first fruit, as Paul describes him, of the general resurrection, the general clean-up that God entered into history to clean up the world and to bring the world back into, uh, uh, reconcile the world to himself, happened in Jesus Christ on that first Easter Sunday. So, let's go through those. First, Jesus lives. Jesus lives. They all tell us, all the Gospel accounts and all Paul's accounts, 
tell us that Jesus is alive. And that means he is no longer, and that has ramifications for us today, he's no longer confined to time and space. He is everywhere. He can journey with his followers without being recognised. He can be experienced in different places at the same time. He can vanish sometimes at the moment of recognition. He can be experienced in the breaking of bread. And if uh, the words of Matthew resonate with me, especially at the end of Matthew's Gospel, and he will be with his followers to the end of the age. Another thing we can discern from the uh, meeting with Mary Magdalene in the, uh, in the garden uh, that first Easter morning is that it's also intensely personal. Mary only recognised Jesus when he addressed, Jesus addressed Mary by name. She thought he was the gardener until she heard her name, Mary. And he recognised her, and she recognised him uh, immediately. The essential tr truth there in, in that Jesus lives is that Jesus is a figure of the present. He's a figure for us today, not just the past. And this has been grounded in 2,000 years of, over 2,000 years of Christian experience. That Jesus is a figure of the present. And even if you have never experienced the presence of Jesus in any way, shape or form, Jesus said, Blessed are those who have seen and who have not seen and yet still believe. You are blessed as well. Because Jesus lives, this leads us to our second affirmation. If Jesus lives, then Jesus is Lord. Jesus is our Lord. Everything he said about himself and his relationship with the Father must have been true. It was just as he says it was. And interestingly, uh, Mary Magdalene in the garden first uh, recognises him and calls him teacher. And then when he says, well, I've got to ascend to the Father, and then, which affirms his divinity, then she addresses him as Lord. It also vindicates everything that Jesus said and did in his life. It was a giant no to all the, the Roman uh, and, uh, army and uh, administration and a huge yes to the kingdom of God in that clash of kingdoms that I talked about uh, in my uh, uh, reflection last Sunday. Now Jesus lives and Jesus is Lord leads us to our final disclosure of reality which is articulated by St Paul, which is that the resurrection is the first act, the first fruit of a process that would eventually bring all things in the world together in God. The Jews always had that fervent hope that God would break into world history and start a giant clean-up of a violent and unjust world, started in Paul and the early church's eyes with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I think it's important to say also that we cannot um, divorce Easter Sunday from Good Friday. To do so can, I think, uh, it risk being too sentimental and a little bit vacuous actually sometimes. Easter is the reversal of Good Friday. We do not just believe in resurrection, we believe in death and resurrection. And this is true for not just uh, all uh, mortal life, that um, when we die we are resurrected, and not even for every dark and bleak situation in life, such as from genocides to the current coronavirus pandemic that we're going through at the moment. It's essentially true for every human response to Jesus in this life. It talks about personal transformation. 
We also have to die to old ways of doing things, to be reborn to a new way of seeing and doing. This is the Christian way, and Christianity was known as the way before we ever became known as Christians. It was the way of life, the way of being. The process that Paul equates with baptism, baptism into Christ. Baptism, of course, originally was a full immersion in water. And so he uses that symbolism to talk about the death and resurrection, going under the water, symbolizing death, coming out of the water, symbolizing new life, death and resurrection. What that means in a really personal sense is that moving from being a, a, a much more self-centered, egocentric person to being a more God-centered person, a process that for most of us is lifelong. It doesn't just happen in a, in a, in a blink of an eye. Paul, Paul calls this process of being, uh, moving away from being self-centered to God-centered. He calls this Christ living in us or through us, which involves us becoming more Christ-like in our lives. Easter means that God's great cleanup of the world has begun. But the paradox there is it won't happen without us. It won't happen without us. St. Augustine, one of the greatest theologians of the Christian Church ever, said, we without God cannot, and God without us will not. God requires us to bring in the kingdom of God. And that evoked for me so much, uh, really, the, the words of Teresa of Avila, of course, that we are his hands, we are his feet. God has no body, Jesus has no body but ours. He relies on us to bring in the kingdom of God. So just as we cannot separate uh, Easter Sunday from Good Friday, we also cannot separate either of those from Pentecost. They're all of a piece. The Easter events, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, culminating in Pentecost, the giving of the Spirit, which in John's Gospel happens on Easter Sunday anyway. These three, they form the whole Christian Paschal mystery of what happened in that uh, last week. The Christian way is a way of personal transformation and that is based on Jesus lives and Jesus is Lord. I'm now going to uh, end uh, with the final uh, blessing as I have done in my last two uh, addresses. May the peace of God which passes all understanding Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you forever.